Today, this webinar is for anyone new to penetrant testing, as well as level threes who might be looking to train um, any trainees who are new to penetrant testing. I am Alex Mastroni. I'm the marketing specialist here in the Glenview, Illinois facility in the United States. I'm stepping in for Ray Daniels today. Um, I've worked at Magnaflux for seven years and I am most proud of creating the level three campaign here at Magnaflux, which we are going to celebrate every September. Uh, uh, you can also find us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, and thank you to everyone who shares application photos of your product. Today I will be presenting with Noemi Gonzalez. Good morning, everyone. I'm Noemi Gonzalez and I'm the Regional Sales Manager for the Midwest. Um, I've been with Magnaflux for 37 years. 34 of those years were I was the International Sales Manager for Asia and all the Latin American countries. So today we kind of want to be starting off with, should I be using LPI? Is this the right process for me? So we're going to be doing just a quick little overview of liquid penetrant testing and kind of give you an idea of some pros and cons of it. And then we're going to dive into the methods and the process to really understand how do you clean? How do you apply penetrant? All those aspects. And then at the very end, we are going to be doing just a little tidbit of how to select a penetrant. Obviously, for the level threes in the room, you know, the lot goes into all these things. So there's only so much we can touch on today. Yes. <laughs> so should I be using the penetrant method? There's a wide variety of materials that can be tested with penetrant. Penetrant can be used for inspection to find defects that are open to the surface and any non-porous materials. These are only our suggestions. You do need to be conforming to your specifications depending on what industries you are in. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of using penetrant are it cannot be used following shot peening and sandblasting unless material is acid etched to remove metal smearing. You will need to remove any paint or coating from the material for penet penetrant testing. Operator training is very important, especially in aerospace. So a lot of these things come into play when asking, should I be using the penetrant method, you know? Even things such as, you know, is this material too dense or too dense for a certain type of penetrant? Um, on the next slide, we have the liquid penetrant process. So once you are sure that the penetrant process is right for you, maybe according to your specifications, um, you can kind of dive more into the liquid penetrant process. So on this slide, I just have a very general overview of all the details um, for the process. Um, once you kind of get this scenario, you'll dive into the methods and the product selection and how to do it more in depth. But these six pictures show the basics of how penetrant process works. So first step number one, you receive a part. You know, your part can come in house, it can come from a customer, um, but there's only one way to guarantee it's clean and that is that you can clean it yourself. So step number two is, you know, after you get the component to you, you'll want to clean it. The best results um, in penetrant testing come from a cleaned part. This is potentially the, the most important step of the liquid penetrant process. Uh, there are contaminants that are highlighted and in there, and you can kind of see those in step one, you know, they're in there, they're in those cracks and uh, those possible indications and if the part's not clean properly then there's a chance that any indication could be missed or the part being inspected um, might not have the results you want at the end of the process. Step number three is you go on to apply the penetrant. So that's applying the penetrant to the surface of the component and you can either do that 100% coverage uh, multiple ways to do that or in a specific test area. For example, if you're only testing like a weld, you, you might only want to test the weld portion of it. Step number four is the excess penetrant is removed. Um, and this you can either do by washing off the excess penetrant with a water from a, a pressurized water gun or a solvent remover on a lint-free clean rag. Care must be taken not to overwash and remove the penetrant from uh, these possible defects. 
Once the part has been sufficiently dry, then you can move on to step five, which is the developer. The developer is given a short time to work effectively, uh, and this will draw out the penetrant trapped in the flaws to make it visible to the surface. The component can then be inspected under the appropriate lighting, depending on if you are doing fluorescent or visible testing. Let's go into these steps one by one and more in more detail. As Alex mentioned, cleaning is a very important part of the process. If the part is not cleaned properly, you can miss some indications. Sur surfaces should be free of foreign materials and paint. Grease, oils, or any foreign material will pre prevent any penetration. The foreign material should be remo removed by pre-cleaning with cleaner remover or by solvent degreasing. Scale, sand, dirt will get trapped in the penetrant and hinder removal. Therefore, we recommend using wire brushing or similar pre-cleaning is necessary. With these processes, always check with your company procedures or your level three. In some materials, we're brushing, wire brushing could damage the part to be inspected. As I mentioned, paint must be removed from areas to be tested. Without proper cleaning, you cannot guarantee your results. Improper cleaning can result in high background, making inspection difficult and time consuming. If a part fails because it wasn't properly cleaned, it can be rejected. Hence, repeating the process over again. That's one thing you do not want to do. <laughs> so in step two, we get to get potentially a little messy. So wear your PPE. <laughs> Applying the penetrant is step number two. So you want to completely cover the test area with penetrant. There are many methods to apply penetrant that we'll go over. Penetrant drill time is determined by the governing specification, so you'll want to be, you know, really close with your level three uh, in, in regarding to those. Longer penetrant times may be needed for uh, dwelling when locating extremely fine or tight discontinuities, depending on your penetrant sensitivity. So here we have a short video of the application of penetrant with a brush over the area to be inspected. Before you want to do this, you want to make sure your penetrant application test area must be clean, dry, and cool. And by cool, I definitely mean temperature. It is important to note that the temperature of the penetrant and the component to be tested should not get too low or too hot. Uh, it should be right around 40 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 to 52 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is all because very cold parts will cause the penetrant to thicken uh, and then slowing the penetrant and removal of the penetrant. Let's say the environment and component is too hot. This will have an adverse effect on the penetrant and will cause the penetrant to dry too quickly. Let's talk about the application methods. There are a variety of methods to be used to apply penetrant. For visible penetrant, the most common use is aerosols. This works great for field inspection. Um, other methods to be used with bulk fluorescent or visible penetrant depends on your specifications or recommended recommendations from your level three. These methods are immersion, brushing and swabbing, spraying, or pouring of the penetrant. So after your penetrant is applied, you're gonna want to let that penetrant dwell on the part. Dwelling allows for the penetrant to seep into and fill the crack. So then after you remove the penetrant, it will come back out and reveal itself on the surface for you to find it. Dwell times are dependent on the type of material, temperature, and specification requirements. So these are a couple general parameters that you see on screen here to find gross cracks and small cracks. Uh, but please remember these are all, you know, just general guidelines. You're gonna have to refer to your company procedures or level three uh, for your exact needs. So after penetrant, after dwelling, we are moving on to the excess penetrant removal stage. Um, this is what you need to do to get the visual contrast between the part 
the developer and the indication. So you will want to remove the penetrant by using a clean lint-free towel. Some surfaces will only require wiping, um, but in general, remove the excess surface penetrant with clean cloths pre-moistened with a cleaner remover. You can do this by dampening the lint-free cloth with solvent and then wipe it across the entire component or test area. Do not ever spray solvent directly onto the component. Um, always spray it directly on a cloth. If cracks are linear, wipe across the cracks rather than along them and um, under removal of uh, the penetrant can cause streaks of color if you don't do it enough um, and can result in no indications as well if you overdo it. So on the next slide, we have the washing parameters that go along with this. Um, the diagrams show, you know, it's kind of like a Goldilocks and the Three Bears scenario going on here. Washing parameters are pretty darn picky. So for example, underwash parts will provide you with no contrast between uh, the developer and the part because penetrant is still on the surface. So you're not really gonna see a difference between the surface and a potential indication. So it's causing that high background. In the second box, you can see the overwash parts remove the penetrant from the indication, causing it to be not be seen because um, it's washing out all the penetrant from the indication so it can't arise to the surface. So we get pretty picky here. Um, you can see on the right, the last one is just right with a perfect washing. And this really comes in between knowing, you know, the pressure of your spray gun um, and how to do this properly. So the drying parameters, the components have to be air dried or oven dried. Oven temperatures should not exceed 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 71 degrees Celsius. If you have a component that has holes or cavities, care should be taken to make sure any excess water has been removed before being dried in the oven. If excess water is left, then this could have an adverse effect on the developer application and inspection. Let's talk about applying developers. Before you start applying the developer, if you're using an aerosol can, the, the developer tends to sit in the bottom of the can or the drum or the pail. So you need to agitate the aerosol can to make sure that all the all the developer is is um, thoroughly stirred, and the same with the the developer in a pail or 55 gallon drum. You need to stir properly to make sure that it's uh, that it's all removed from the bottom. Let's address the developer types. There are four developer types, and these are these are the differences. Dry powder is to be used only with fluorescent penetrant. Components must be dried before applying the dry developer or the non-aqueous developer. The dry powder should be applied in such a manner as to contact all surfaces to be inspected. The excess dry developer may be removed by light tapping or light air blow off not exceeding 5 psi. Dry developer should not be used with type 2 penetrants. The non-aqueous developer, the components must also be dried before applying the developer. You must apply as a uniform thin coating over entire surface to be inspected. Excuse me. Water suspendable and water soluble are supplied as a powder. The developer must be mixed with water with proper concentration and you can check your product data sheets, which will show you the concentrations to be used. You apply it to the parts while the part is wet. Then you dry the parts. The penetrant process sequence is different with dry and non-aqueous developer. Remember, with dry and non-aqueous developer, you must dry the parts before applying the developer. With water suspendable and water soluble, there's no need to dry the parts before you apply the, the developer. Okay, so now we get to have some fun and inspect the test area. What, what? Yeah. So 
<laughs> so when inspecting your test area, if you find any indications um, and they prove to be something worth noting, record your findings. Take pictures if it's necessary mm -hmm. and compare it to a known defect standard. All of this is within your requirements. Um, mark the indication as well if that's needed. Uh, the part and component can then either be scrapped, it can be reworked or repaired um, to be acceptable for service. You know, we're starting to see a lot of these more posted, you know, on LinkedIn or Instagram. So please continue sharing photos of your findings and hashtag Magnaflux. So how do you select the penetrant that you're supposed to use? It's up to the responsible NDT personnel who will dictate the process. Factors to be considered when selecting the type of liquid penetrant system are, what are the specifications are you working with? Often the specifications will guide you to the proper method and sensitivity of the penetrant. You need to consider the composition of the parts to be inspected, number size and weight of the parts to be inspected, location at which test is required. Is it, are you gonna do the inspection inside the facility or are you gonna do field inspection? The type and size of indications. You need to check with your local authorities for disposal materials like aerosol cans, bulk material through the drain. And if you do not have any idea of what penetrant method to use, we strongly recommend a penetrant evaluation to be done on your actual parts. So diving a bit into methods. So methods are where we get a bit more specific uh, about the steps that you need to take for your inspection. So depending on what method is used for your penetrant inspection will determine the steps needed during inspection. There are four penetrant methods. Uh, method A, which you can see here, which is water washable. Next, we have method B, D, which is post-emulsifiable lipophilic and post-emulsifiable hydrophilic. And then finally, on the last slide, we have method C, which is solvent removable. Thank you everyone for coming to Fundamentals of Penetrant Testing. Please send any feedback to our support team and interact with us on LinkedIn. Add Noemi and myself on LinkedIn if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.